Hello, good evening, and welcome to this very, very special event. First off, I want to acknowledge the lands on which we're gathered today, and in particular recognise that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd like to specifically acknowledge that the Wurundjeri and the Burrawong people, communities of the Kulin Nation, are the ongoing custodians of the lands on which Monash University and the Clayton Campus now stands. So we pay our respects through our research, through our teaching, through our learning to the Wurundjeri and the Burrawong elders and their past, present and future communities, particularly their children, which is what we're all here today for. And indeed, this is grandly titled STEM Findings from the Play Lab, Concepts, Creativity and Collective Thinking of Infants, Toddlers and Preschoolers. Monash has a long tradition of STEM research, science, technology, engineering and maths, but the Play Lab is very, very different. Now, you haven't come here to hear me talk about the Play Lab. This is why ARC Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer and her team are here for the evening. But I will tell you before they talk about the Play Lab that we are super proud as a faculty to have Marilyn and her team as one of our number. The Play Lab's work is a definite high point for all of us within the faculty, and we're genuinely inspired and genuinely thrilled to be associated with you. We can ride on your, your coattails. To have an ARC laureate professor in a faculty of education is really, really rare. So we're super, super proud of Marilyn. Before we let Marilyn and her team loose on you, though, I have a bit of housekeeping. Number one, get involved in the polls. We want to make this interactive. We've got a huge online audience, and we've got a very select audience in the room as well. Get involved with, um, I was going to call it Slido, slido.com. Um, we're going to have um, a dynamic Q&A session at about 7.30. So if you want to get involved with the polls, you can upvote and downvote and choose questions that you want these people to answer. So you have power. So get your phones out. And those of you that are on YouTube, live streamers, please put your comments and your questions into the YouTube comments section. However, that means you have to be logged on to YouTube in order to do that. So if you don't know how to log on to YouTube... The instructions have been put up in the chat um, and also in your in introductory email. So do log on. And I also need to encourage you all to use Twitter during this event. We have hashtags. We have a uh, hashtag conceptual play world, hashtag STEM, and don't forget to tag, tag at Monash Education. We're aiming to go viral. But in a good way. So anyway, let's get on with things. Without any further ado, I want to introduce the Play Lab and her team, Laureate Professor Marilyn Fleer. Thank you for that very warm welcome, Neil, and uh, welcome to everyone here. I have to say it's very special to be here in person because we were talking earlier on um, out, out in the foyer but also um, in the room here about how um, many of us haven't been together personally for such a long time. So this is really special for our VIP group that's here this evening and also um, hard luck for all the others that are zooming in from elsewhere. Um, I have to say that it feels very strange to be in front of real people after having seen little postage-sized people on a screen for, for two years um, and zooming in from Bunurong country, from where, where my home is. Um, so it's really very special to be here with you. And um, I know the team, which um, we'll go through and introduce as we go along, um, I'm sure we'll make similar comments too. So... You've all seen what we're going to present. Um, Neil's given you a, a quick overview of um, the, the kind of things that we're going to cover. And um, what we're specifically going to do as a team, and you can see um, our team is um, presenting. Um, first of all, I'll be talking a little bit about um, our programmatic research for those people who've not um, been involved in previous um, public lectures before or don't know an awful lot about our work, so I'll say a little bit about that. Um, then I will also talk a little bit about the, um, um, the um, conceptual play world intervention that we use because that keeps us as a team uh, together and it's very much the focus of what we do. Many of you may well know, particularly those online, um, know what that is, but there'll be others who don't, so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. And then each of us, um, so 
Coulson and I will share some findings from some of our papers. And, um, and Coulson gets to do the really cool stuff, which is she shows some really nice video clips and some photos. Um, then Prabhat and Sonia will um, also do the same thing, and, but both of them are sharing really cool stuff. Um, I do all the boring stuff today. And, um, and then um, I'll speak a little bit more about some of our other papers and, and bring it to a close. And then I'll share with you right at the end um, our very new video that we want to launch tonight as part of part of this evening. So you get to see it first and then it goes live on Twitter later. So that's what we're going to do. And our focus, of course, is around um, infants, toddlers, um, preschoolers and into the school area. So um, we have a very diverse group of people um, who are streaming in from across the globe um, and also a diverse group of people who will be listening later because it's, you know, probably two in the morning for many of them. So if, you, if that's you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you've um, joined in tonight, tomorrow, or in the early morning. Um, so, um, so without further um, introduction to what we're doing, um, I give you, I'll begin with the overview of, um, of, of our research um, program. And as many of you know, but others don't, we have three areas of research that our Play Lab covers. Um, one is in relation to infants, toddlers and preschoolers' conceptual development and further into school. Um, and that um, has been led by um, our wonderful colleague, Lakiria Fragedaki, who's now um, in, has a fabulous job in Greece and um, soon to be appointed is Sue March to, um, to take on leading that particular area of research. Um, and we're really, with that one, we're... COVID, of course, has got in the way, but it's a longitudinal study um, which has had a huge hiccup. But we, nevertheless, we've soldiered on and we have some really important things to share with you about that. Um, and some of it will be shared tonight. Our second pillar, Prabhat Ray leads, um, and Sonia is, is part of that research group, as Kulsum is part of Glicaria's and my research group in the first, first pillar. And that's focused very much on families. And um, Prabhat has some specific acknowledgements that he wants to give later on, and um, I won't spoil his thunder by sharing any of that now. And our third pillar, um, it covers teachers' development. And Anne Siriani has our, as our research fellow who's joined us, and I'm just waving to her now, um, as uh, part of our team. And she's, she will be taking that pillar of research forward. Um, so, so you can see that it's quite a diverse area of research, but we're super excited because we're now three years down the track of learning an awful lot. And for those of you who followed us over the over each of the public lectures that we've given over the last three years, um, you'll see there are a few little things that we'll emphasise, but it's a whole lot of new things that uh, we want to share tonight. What holds us all together is our conceptual play world. It is our intervention. We use it in families. We use it in childcare centres, preschools and schools. And we also use it as part of, of a teacher professional development, so in terms of their development as, um, as teachers and as educators. And, and some of you may not know what that is, so I'm just going to give a very brief summary. So, and I'll try and give a, a nice practice example for those of you who are educators and, and want to hear another idea about a conceptual play world. If um, there are five characteristics of a conceptual play world, and the first characteristic, um, and these are not in order of how you teach it uh, or how you use it as a, as a model of teaching, um, but it is for the planning. And the first one is in relation to the selection of a story. Um, and the reason why the story is really important, and if we use the story of the, um, the Bernstein bears and the spooky old tree as an example, um, it's not the traditional STEM book. It's not about science, it's not about technology, it's not about engineering, it's not about mathematics at first glance. But when characteristic two, you jump into the story and you go into a conceptual play world that the teachers have designed. So that might be um, out and outdoors with a trestles 
covered in um, covered in blankets um, to simulate the spooky old tree that the three bears enter uh, uh, with a light, a stick and a rope, and the light in this case is a torch. Um, this then becomes the imaginary play world and teachers, educators and children all go into this imaginary play situation together. So it's planning a, uh, and designing a space that becomes this imaginary play world. And the third characteristic is, is planning some kind of routine to enter and exit so that you're signalling you're in the imaginary play situation and you're signalling when you're out of the imaginary play situation. And, um, and so that could be in the example of the, of the spooky old tree, could be, because remember the bear is very scary to children um, as the way it's presented in this particular story, that the, um, that the children can come up with the teachers of some sort of entry routine. So that might be a, a lullaby to pacify the bear or it could be uh, a light and sound show to wow the bear and distract them. So, and, and then you enter and you have what's the fourth characteristic, you meet a play inquiry of some kind, some problem arises, which might not be in the book, but it's something that the teachers, the educators plan and to encourage the idea of the drama of the story at the same time as motivating the children to want to solve this problem because they have the empathy with the, with the three bears. And so the problem might be that they've lost the torch. How are they going to go into the spooky old tree? Or the problem might be how do we bring light into, um, into the tunnel to go inside the spooky old tree? Do we use a big mirror to reflect the light and so on? And being very thoughtful about the kind of concepts, and remember tonight's about concepts, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And our last characteristic is actually about the planning of the interactions between the teachers, the educators. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that now because we're going to show you parts of that. What does that look like in families? What does it look like in childcare centres, preschools and schools? So that's our intervention with the five characteristics. And, um, and we're super proud, proud of this model because it's come out of um, before the ARC, the Australian Research Council Laureate Fellowship Award. It came out of 10 years of research. So of course, we're very interested to know, um, and Anne's leading the way on this, what impact that can have. Um, what impact can it have with families and Prabhat's leading that work. How are those children's conceptual learning developing over time in STEM? And, of course, that's the, the work of the first pillar. So to take this now forward, and I forgot to press that button, there's our three pillars. Um, we, I want to um, um, suggest that because we, in our research, have been following teachers and children, one of the things that has come up, so I'm talking now an overview before we go into the specific papers, but one of the things that's come up a lot has been, has been well, what do we mean when we talk about a concept? And what, is it, um, what does this really mean for this early period of children's development? Because we know from research, past research, that the infant and toddler period has been very much under-researched. And what does it mean in a play-based setting? So, so this work, the conceptual play, as part of the conceptual play world, um, asks us to think about some of these things that I have on the screen here. So if we were thinking about uh, a science topic, for example, when we're thinking about very young children, we're thinking about the phenomenon, so rainbows, because it's personally meaningful. It's something that in the story of the... Uh, three bears going into the spooky old tree to refract the light and create a light and sound show for the bear can be something that has to be really explored and understood. So how do we refract light? Uh, how do we create this rainbow? So children very much are asking those kinds of questions when they see the rainbow. But we know, of course, from our research that there's there in the past and in the present that children have these curiosities, but the concept itself is very abstract and very contained. And the concept, when we look at children's thinking in this area, we know that um, children are um, that some children they think about darkness, 
not the light, because the spooky old trees, so you can see why I've chosen that example tonight. They think about, because that's spooky, full of drama and, and can be worrying or can be, can be exciting. Um, it depends on their experiences. But they also, thinking about light, so they don't think about the absence of light. Um, I think about the absence of light, but light travelling in straight lines, light being able to be blocked, Oh, a shadow, a light um, being able to be refracted, as I've mentioned, um, absorbed, different um, elements of light being absorbed, um, and so on. So all of those things really matter. And so the big question then becomes, um, how do we think about that in relation to the pros and cons of do we begin with a concept or do we begin uh, with a phenomenon? So let's let's have a look at some of what we've learned from our research, just again collectively. So we know that um, the pro in terms of the phenomenon, that this connects with the child's life. Of course, rainbows do. Um, it's of interest to the child and therefore the child is more likely to want to understand the science. They're more motivated to want to know how does this, how does, where does the rainbow come from? Um, but there are cons as well. So it's difficult to transfer knowledge about rainbows. So it's difficult to transfer a phenomenon to other contexts. And also the science to explain the everyday phenomenon may be too complex for very young children. So these are the, these are the kinds of things that um, we've learned uh, about what worry educators, what worry um, curriculum developers and so on. And then if we think about beginning with the science concept, then big ideas in science give explanatory power to children. And this helps them to predict um, to get, that are predictable and, um, and they can transfer them to other contexts if they have this idea of a, of a concept. And in previous presentations I've talked about that quite a bit because a child who goes into a shopping centre and thinks in an everyday way about a shopping, a shopping centre and wants to find the toothbrush or the toothpaste will go up and down all the aisles to look for it. But a child who thinks conceptually will actually go across the top and, and recognise it's a classification system and that we just need to find the toiletries aisle and we then go and find the, find the toothpaste. So I, I've given that as an example before. But this gives you a sense of the, the power of, of a child who thinks in that way. But of course, science concept, concepts are very complex and focusing on concepts may not be personally meaningful for a child if we just isolate our thinking around the concept only. Another pro is having knowledge of scientific concepts helps children to navigate their world and to make scientifically informed decisions. And it's probably something that's particularly useful to all of us at the moment. Um, if we're thinking about the current COVID context, climate change and all the other things in our world, we can think more, we can think more about um, what's happening in our world and make, make everyday decisions that contribute to the better good of society or the environment or whatever it might be. But also the cons, the concept might not be relevant to the cultural community. So some concepts, because they are abstractions created historically for societies to be able to do certain things, um, look different in different cultural communities. And so sometimes this becomes missing as well. So we've learned a lot collectively about conceptual play worlds um, for thinking about the phenomenon, thinking about the concept. But when we think about this in terms of the teaching model, and we can use this continuum idea here, um, if we're thinking about children's play on the left and we're thinking about science learning on the right, there are different kinds, and there are many, one minute, <laughs> um, many, many scenarios to, um, to explore here. And, um, and what, what we have is we have this shift of different models of teaching that, and these are very rudimentary, so there's many more, of course, where we're looking at science um, discovery. Uh, we're looking at spontaneous play with some everyday learning of science at, at the more end of the play scenario. And at the other end of the science concept scenario, we're looking at process skills like observing, classifying, communicating, measuring, etc. cetera. Um, but we can also be looking at um, guided um, play and, and inquiry-based learning. And this continuum is often what, what we explore. 
But the, um, the thing that's very interesting about all of this is that often um, it's like the idea of play and learning. These are often set up as a binary and our conceptual play world throws that out the window because it isn't a binary. We, it's a synthesis. It's a synthesis of children's development with play as a leading activity at the same time as creating conceptual play worlds to give conditions where children are meaningfully learning STEM because they want to. They want to solve that problem. They have that empathy with, with the three bears and they want to know more about how to refract light or they want to know more about the concept of light. To, to illustrate this um, more poignantly, if we, um, if we think about the book on, books on the left, these factual texts, which are very important, if we're thinking about do we start with the concept or we just, do we start with the story, then the concepts and the books, they present um, a scenario where there isn't any drama, there's facts. Um, the children may or may not be motivated to want to know about that. Um, and also it can be very isolated from their everyday lives when, when you read the text in these very um, uh, traditional uh, factual textbooks. The book on the right that I've been talking about um, sets up the drama, but on its own it, it doesn't take you to the conceptual play world that we are talking about. It gives you a wonderful drama, it gives you a rich experience, but it needs a teacher, an educator, to change and jump into the story to bring out the drama, to set up the play problems so when the bears go into the play world, suddenly there is a, um, a set of bulbs, batteries, wires, and the children have to make their own torch. So it sets up a very different problem on another day. So to that's given you the big overview. And um, what I'm going to do now is just share very quickly in my one minute. <laughs> um, I'm not sure where that one minute came from, but anyway. <laughs> uh, we have a different plan here. <laughs> um, I'm going to share three papers and, um, and then we're going to move um, from that first um, um, set of papers to other papers and essentially these are the kinds of findings that we want to talk to you about tonight. So we've had the big overview, we know what the conceptual play world is, we know the research um, context in which we're working, you know that now if you didn't know it before and these are the findings and I'm going to begin with this one and then Kusum and I will talk to the second one thereafter. So Three papers um, of what we've been learning and, of course, um, in the chat you will find references or links to our um, to these papers and if you don't have access um, to these papers through, through university libraries as such, we also have on our website the working papers, which a working paper is just the version before it went out for review and was tweaked or whatever took place in the review process. So it essentially will give you the same information, the same findings, and sometimes a bit more <laughs> because we have to take things out sometimes um, to meet um, journal requirements. So what have we learned? So we've learned that inside the imaginary situation of a conceptual play world, so coming back to the bears in the imaginary situation there of the spooky old tree, we've learned that actually this model um, brings together through the story um, a very different set of developmental conditions for children. So under these conditions, what we've learned is that um, teachers take a very active role. They're no longer the audience to children's play, they're actually embedded in it. And this is a very big shift and we've learned that the conceptual play world supports that process. We've also learned that in the play worlds, teachers actually support children's um, development through metacognitive, uh, metacommunicative actions where they are using words um, like an example of rocking a baby and, um, and using the word rock, rock, rock. So they use language to enhance what's happening and to amplify it and to emotionally charge it so that it's when it's scary in the spooky old tree, the teachers are amplifying that and are making it even more emotionally exciting for the children. They also use words that we've noticed that children do in play where they use these conjunction terms so that rather than a series of 
propositions being put out um, or set of questions, which is often what happens in a lesson around STEM, it actually becomes quite different in the sense that they, they use these words like and, and, and then, and they build the storyline, and that creates more drama. And that what's very significant is that because they are play partners inside the imaginary situation, they actually show mature forms of play for the children. Just as we know matters for younger children playing with older children, they watch, they look and they learn what older children do in their play. And so here we have these wonderful scenarios where often they're not multi-age groups, where the teachers are actually modelling different ways of playing together. And whilst that, um, whilst that might seem at first glance to to, to not make sense, it's actually in the context of being in the spooky old tree, living the drama of the story and being curious about what's going on and how can we solve this problem, how can we help the bears, what can we do here, I can do, you know, and, and being the characters trying things out. It actually means that the children are, are actually supported to mature their play. Often people think of play as just an activity, but play is actually, a, is actually part of the leading work, a leading activity of children in this early period and therefore it becomes very important to develop that further so that the imagination and creativity that's embedded within imagining things that don't exist, such as abstract concepts, or imagining things that can be part of the play scenario, such as I can imagine the, the stick here, I might not have a stick but I'm imagining it, um, is very, very important. And so if we now move to our second paper, um, we've also found um, that and this comes back to what we learned inside the imaginary situation, the way the teachers change the conditions for children's development. We've also learned that, that contrary to most of the literature about children's play, what we've learned is that teachers who are involved in children's play, we actually see the children in their child-initiated play, you know, when they have the choice to do things, not be part of a lesson or not be part of a group time, when they choose their play activities, what we're starting to see, and we're interested to know more about this, we're starting to see conceptual play worlds that children initiate. And we see that they're reliving those experiences, like the spooky old tree. They're reliving the, the STEM learning that's associated with it and making it even more complex and challenging the educators, which is fantastic. But what we have noticed also is that if the children are not supported in that environment, um, because you want to give space for children, what we've also learned for them to initiate and take things forward, if they're not then supported with these new initiatives, then it doesn't go anywhere. It stops. So this suggests to us that the role of the educator in children's play is absolutely paramount for STEM learning and probably all kinds of learning. Then we also, as the last paper, um, interested in um, actually the concepts. And so we're using, we also studied um, engineering concepts and in terms of the, um, the genesis of this for design. And what we actually learned from our research was that... Um, that play gave the space, so these conceptual play worlds, gave the space to actually act as a source of development for design because there was a purpose, you know, to, to map out the route that you might take in the spooky old tree. And designing your new um, torch or mechanism, whatever it might be. And so the design dimension um, was very much supported in the play scenarios. We also learned that um, by extending, um, this gave the possibility to extend, extend children's design solutions because in the play, you're revisiting things over and over and over. It's just not a one-off lesson. It's you go back into the play world, you experience it and new problems arise and so on. So new, new opportunities for more design solutions are generated. But also it amplified this design cognition. And so if you're interested, the, um, the paper, which I'm assuming is um, being put in the chat function now, you can read up about all the details about the design cognition and design processes that emerged in the conceptual play world. But I really want to say one important thing, which is a, will be a theme throughout what we're presenting, and that is that 
there was a sense of collective design. This is not about the individual designing. This is about this notion of the collective design because they have a collective problem they're trying to solve. And this is new and different for this cultural age period of infants, toddlers and preschoolers. So that gives you a sense of the first part, which was around how imagination was being supported and developed um, as part of the processes through these three papers. Um, but also um, what I want to share with you now with, um, with Coulson um, is that we also were very interested to look at the nature of this imagining of concepts um, over time and how that changes for children. And as part of this process, we have uh, a series of papers, and I'm just going to talk to the first one. And, um, and so we, we looked at, in this case, the, as a team, we looked at the nature um, of children's imagining of concepts. And what we learned over time um, was that the conceptual play world in STEM seemed to generate a narrative that created this intellectual and emotionally charged con con context for infants. So I'm talking about infants now. And this was really, really important. The emotional dimension was incredibly important and for, for changing the, the interactions. It also allowed for a different kind of interaction between the adults and the children because they could intentionally and, and um, responsibly support the children's initiatives because they were there together in the same imaginary play. The book, the imaginary play scenario um, created that. And, it, and the reciprocity between, um, the conceptual reciprocity between the adults and children was there through the way in which they were engaging. But when we look at this for older children or even, the, or, or even um, for the infants specifically, how the educators did this was really quite significant. And you can see here um, the vibrant tone, the narration with action, um, directing talk to infants, responding and amplifying children's initiatives. But also props mattered. And I'm going to call upon Coulson to actually show us how. And she, remember I said she's got the cool stuff? Does it come down? I'm a bit challenged to vertically. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I just want to share a very fascinating and very amazing um, set data set that I use for my research. And it focuses on um, the toddler age period. Let me just go to my page. That's me. So it focuses specifically on the, in the toddler age period and how props supported not only the toddlers but also the adults to engage in the collective imagining of the conceptual play worlds. So one of the major findings of my study was how props, concrete props, something that you can touch and feel and see, created conditions for the development of imagination and science concepts in toddlers. So for doing that, how it all started was there was this amazing storybook that the toddlers really, really liked. They loved reading it every single day. They came into the toddler room and the educator would read it as they engaged and they made sounds. And the book was uh, called Follow the Tiger by Melanie Joyce. It was a very simple book which talked about a tiger that went around the jungle to greet all the animals that lived in the jungle. And they absolutely loved it and they loved, uh, they played, uh, they talked about animals and did things that animals did every day. So uh, we decided, um, the educator and the researcher, which was me, uh, decided to improvise the conceptual play a little bit and story a little bit. And so one day when the educator was reading the story, she receives a call from the tiger. And the tiger is in a state of panic, and the tiger um, informs the educator that, um, uh, that the flamingo is missing from the jungle. So he needs the toddlers and the teachers and the educators' help. 
So everyone, uh, so that's how uh, it actually started. It took around three months, conceptual play worlds. I was there for much longer, like six, seven months, <laughs> just hanging around. <laughs> but no, no, it was really fun being with the toddlers and um, the educators designing, planning the conceptual play worlds. So um, initially when it all started, there were a lot of props heavily, heavily, available for the children. So the children loved animal toys, animal figurines, photos, books, anything to do with, and they even loved the animal suits. They would wear that and run around and have a play, enjoy themselves, but there wasn't much meaning to their play at that point in time when it all started, but definitely they had fun, and so did I. Uh, so that was how it all started. But as the pro uh, uh, conceptual play worlds progressed, we saw, we noticed that the, the children began to engage with the story a little bit more than the props. So we see towards the middle, in three months, like um, one and a half months time, we see the props are getting a little bit less. So if you want to be, if someone wants to be a zebra, they don't want to wear the suits now, a uh, year, or tail would do, but they would want to go into the jungle to look for the tiger and think about what the jungle actually looks like. They would become animals and they would explore the jungle, which is the habitat, the concept of habitat in its everyday form. And uh, they would uh, also explore the different animal characteristics, the biological characteristics, which is the scientific concept of what they look like, what they, you know, design, shape, things like, and what they are becoming, tigers, zebras, bears, and the likes. So that, and as it continued, towards the end of the conceptual play was implementation. I'm going to talk about one of the focus children, Chloe. That's a pseudonym. She didn't want to wear anything. Now, I am the zebra today. I'm not going to wear anything. But I am going to go into the jungle. So as they're exploring the jungle, they find some pink, pink feathers, which of course the educator has put, but they don't know. So Chloe, she picks up the pink feather, she looks at it, and she's like, she encouraged everyone around her to come and look for the flamingo, the lost flamingo. And she calls her friends and the teachers, everyone who's listening to her, and this, um, and then, and then she, she, she just says, like, we need to find the flamingo, let's go. She, there's this sense of urgency that she's actually inside the jungle. Um, so that, 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 there you see that how the concrete props have kind of transitioned into an abstract. So this pink, flam pink feather symbolizes the flamingo for her now, that she doesn't need the flamingo suit or the flamingo toy. Um, she, it's just a feather. So... Next is this 40 second video, which will provide a snapshot of this very powerful transition of toddlers into imaginary play and engaging with science concepts. Enjoy. Sorry about the bad filming because uh, I fell down when they suddenly went in <laughs> it's under the river. I was like, I couldn't control myself. But I found this clip very, very powerful. You see how she's engaging with narratives, how she's thinking, how the table has become the river. You know, sometimes it was the cave and they would step on um, cushions and that would become the big rocks that they're going on and they would climb trees and talk about what they see up from up there, whether they see the flamingo or not. So that was the kind of um, amazing stuff that I uh, did through this project. Um, I, and, and that makes me think about the possibilities of 
if conceptual fables is actually embedded within the practices, you know, the kind of impact we could have on children's learning and development. Thank you. Thank you, Coulson. So, to, to just to finish this little section before we hand over to Prabhat and Sonia is to say that we've also um, taken deep dive into this area and found, and again in the chat there will be um, references to these papers, but what we found specifically um, that was very important for us was how this collective imagining was being developed. And Coulson showed so beautifully in her examples there how the, how the children and the educators began with the props and later on it was it went from the concrete specifically to these imaginary scenarios. So this abstraction, this collective nature of abstraction is being developed through the conceptual play worlds. And the collective nature of it is very important. Similarly, we found similar thing, we found this in relation to engineering concepts for older children as well, that, that to explore um, principles of engineering for young children was also collectively formed and beginning with abstracts, uh, abstract contexts. And this then, um, we can bring that together and say that for the section that uh, Kulsum and I just shared with you, that we've looked specifically at centre-based practices here. So we're looking at childcare centres, preschools. But actually, what does this mean when we start to think about families and community context? So we're going to hand over to Prabhat and Sonia to, uh, to tell us. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, before I go forward, I should acknowledge in case you walked into this room today, and next to the foyer, if you have seen fantastic display and you really liked it, there are a few people you should, you know, I, I must acknowledge their effort. Uh, Dr. Jason Crow, Dr. Charity Edwards from MADA, our fantastic <laughs> colleagues. Uh, our fantastic student who has put an effort in doing this, Monique, and Anne Suryani, who has just joined in and came to help us. So thank you all for putting this together. Uh, it looks great. Uh, now, uh, coming down to our presentation, uh, that is a uh, fantastic you know, uh, plot, in fact. Madeline, uh, in the beginning, presented a naughty problem, you know, which is, do we begin with the concept or the play problem? And I would like to take uh, it forward and say, in the family setting, we often have this challenge of, you know, because do we begin with the science concept or child's motive or interest? Because in our conversation with families, uh, we often hear that my boy is into big machines, he likes trucks, he likes sports cars, fire trucks, her favorite is this. Uh, she likes uh, Elsa, Arna, Disney princes. So we hear all these interesting anecdotes when we talk to families. Uh, so what do you do as a responsive researcher? Should you tell families how to do science and forget about all the child's interest, or tell them what they can do is basically what their child like? So one of the ways uh, we engage with this quandary is uh, to move away from asking children interest questions to understanding children's social situation of development, which means that understanding children's development holistically, taking note of children's everyday practices, their daily routines, their parents' motives, and what matters for their children's development. So from, from that perspective, then we start working with families. This then help us in weaving the concept, child's motives, and tools at large uh, that also includes technology. At a simplistic level, our response is to think of a creation of a new developmental condition uh, and uh, you can think of it in, in, in a metaphor like a triple helix, where you know, each activity setting when we design, we think of creating within the play world is guided by then weaving of how does it contribute to concept learning? How does it respond to children's motive of engaging in the activity? And thirdly, which is equally important, is uh, how can we think carefully about the tool use that we need to mediate to create these new developmental conditions? Uh, now, we have 
talked about uh, some of these arguments in our paper where our focus was largely to theorize our Zoom-based conceptual play world's intervention with families. Uh, we are making primarily three broad claims there. One, for the need to transcend the binary between the digital and the non-digital. Uh, uh, digital coadjuvance, as conceptualized by Marilyn in her uh, previous research, creates new amplified possibilities of action and learning. And third is to think of the digital intervention from the lens of artifact-mediated action, drawing on the work of philosopher Marx Wotowski and his historical epistemology. Our argument is that the, fam the technology act as a primary, secondary, and tertiary artifacts based on the purpose of tool use. This motive of engagement is central that technology than technology itself. So uh, moreover, we are also suggesting that it is not a question of merely design thinking or design principle, but a theoretical model that guides technology. So the term model here is very central because we're drawing on Wotowski's work in trying to say that it's being used in a special sense when one wants to talk about inventing the future or creating the future together with others. So model thus creates a case for theoretical framing in developing practices and also act as a shared script of action between parents and researchers. So conceptual play world model from that perspective works as a kind of a shared script for negotiation or conversation between the families and uh, uh, the educator. Now, coming to the pedagogical aspect of our research, these are uh, five, uh, four things which we really value while working uh, a pedagogic model, which is around understanding the children's social situation of development, uh, focusing on the agentic engagement of families and children, trying to develop a new pedagogic consciousness, which is the play-based pedagogy. And lastly, our effort is to sustain the practice, not to end it once the family has basically you know, once we have finished our intervention. So uh, it largely moves in these uh, four steps. Uh, I have less time, as Santal shows me. So uh, this is building common knowledge, engaging in development of a collective imaginary situation, focusing on developing a play pedagogy for families, and then trying to build a confidence in family through our work so that they are confidently able to do this work in future. We also share a lot of resources with families because sometimes they find it very difficult to find resources to support children's STEM learning over a period of time. So that's also part of sustaining the narrative. Now, uh, I'll do this quickly because, uh, so one of the important thing, you know, is that our effort is largely, as Madeline mentioned, is to think of this development of this collective imaginary situation, uh, which demands children and their parents uh, can develop a kind of empathy to the character of the story, the children's story which we are working with. It also means extension of this imaginary situation to other aspects of their everyday life. We often see that rhyme or a sentence works very well as a peg, you know, to get the sustained attention and support uh, their entry into the imaginary play worlds. Uh, for example, in the story of Gingerbread Jan, uh, it was this rhyme you know, which we used recently, run, run, as fast as you can, you can't catch me, I'm a gingerbread Jan. And it becomes a kind of a hook for children you know, into the collective imaginary situation. So there is an effort to, create, to carefully design pedagogy that offer possibility of embodied action and be together and show to others that they are together. So uh, a big credit for designing these interesting play worlds basically goes to our uh, Play Lab colleague, Dr. Rebecca Lewis and Oriana Romino, who you also see in the storytelling sessions here. Uh, can we play them? Nothing. 
Yeah. So you see, you know, these very interesting new situations being created in the home setting. We talked about gingerbread Jan, but you heard gingerbread mummy, gingerbread dogs. All these interesting characters keep coming in. So there's a possibility which you know, which which this model creates for once once students are basically engaged in these situations, there is a possibility of extension. The agentic extension is coming not from us, but rather from the families themselves. Uh, now. Moving forward, there is also, you know, you see an example of uh, how this uh, kitchen space basically has been used as developing a kind of a play pedagogy in the home setting. Uh, I, I could not give you uh, the, the basic, you know, larger story around it. So uh, this is largely based on Gingerbread Man's story, and we changed it or transformed it into Gingerbread Jan to engage uh, or encourage girls' participation in this. Uh, and it was largely around the concept of chemical reactions. And uh, we basically created possibilities where we talked more about baking in the home setting and where families can do baking. And then we basically tried to weave the narrative of chemical change within the everyday practice of baking. Uh, Yeah, so uh, this is largely to also highlight and show that, you know, uh, how central and important is adults' engagement in sustaining children's narrative, and that's what is basically, uh, the, this basically is around. So we heard stories of families baking together, children's playing with their dogs, pretending of gingerbread giants, uh, a number of things around it. But what was very central for us is that how we can basically use an everyday practice of baking, and it becomes a context for introducing this new narrative of chemical change in language, which is play-based and leads to development of new mediated relationship. Children becomes aware of the right temperature, as you heard, as, importance of chemical, as important for chemical reaction what we see is that the everyday concept acquires this new relationship, and its relationship with the object is transformed. The families have also reported to us extension of these children's curiosity, like a child asking, why does a coffee smell when you add boiling water to it, a number of other things of those, those sorts. I'll not go into the details of it at, the, at this point. But what I'm trying to say is uh, that this new play-based pedagogic model offers this opportunity for families to offer robust concept learning for families using children's storybook and, of course, imagination. Uh, and to, maybe I'll just skip this one and just come straight here, to sum up that, you know, what we are doing is basically is an effort at theoretical, methodological, and pedagogical, all the three levels. So conceptual play worlds and create these opportunities to study children's development in motion, not as something which has uh, happened in the past, but by creating these new developmental conditions, it also takes a more holistic view of children's development by not just talking about in situation or in situ responses of the child, but understanding the social situation of development holistically. And lastly, and more importantly, and probably we are conscious of the importance of the adult or researcher have in children's play. So uh, what I have shared is basically uh, our intervention, which has been done with a number of families together. Uh, our bright student, PhD student, uh, Sonia Nedovic, has uh, been working with individual families using a similar model. And I'll pass it on to her to present her research. Sorry. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Prabhat. My name is Sonia Nedevic. I'm a PhD student with the Conceptual Play Lab and I'm part of Pillar 2. We're examining STEM concept formation in the home setting. Tonight I'm very excited to give you a snapshot of a pilot study which we completed last year. The pilot study sought to answer two questions. Number one, how do conceptual play world interventions in the home setting create motivating conditions for children's STEM concept formation across cultural age periods? And number two, what is the role of imagination in children's STEM concept formation in the early years? When we discuss cultural age periods, we are looking at opportunities for siblings to enter a collective space where they can learn through conceptual play. Because we view development through the lens of culture rather than biology, we include all siblings in conceptual play worlds. How do we do this? We do this by placing different demands on children in response to their cultural age. These demands relate to Vygotsky's theory of leading activity. Leading activity refers to the predominant activity of each child during a developmental period. For example, in the short video we're about to see, Peyton is five years of age and her leading activity is play of an imaginary nature. Now, I'm a little bit behind with my... Here we go. So let me introduce you to five-year-old Peyton. There's a good chance that Peyton is watching on the big screen tonight from her home. So if you're there, Peyton, hello. Peyton is an energetic and eager to learn preschooler who was delighted to engage in this pilot study. Peyton's mother, Christy, was also very engaged to support Peyton in her STEM learning and to be guided by the process of the conceptual play world intervention. Together, we shared six play world sessions over Zoom, all of which were based on the book Sheep in a Jeep. Sheep in a Jeep is a picture storybook which follows the narrative of a flock of sheep who push, who push a jeep up and down the hilly terrain of a farm. Now, I know you're probably really eager to find out more about this chair, which you see in the photo. Peyton and her mother worked very hard to create this chair, which is the driver's seat of the Jeep. This is where Peyton Unicorn Sheep would sit to navigate the vehicle around the farm. You can see that the seat belt, brake lights, number plate and steering wheel have all been considered in the innovation. The scientific concept relevant to this book is inertia, which is one of Isaac Newton's laws of motion. The law of inertia states that something moving will continue moving unless a force acts upon it. Conversely, something sitting still will continue to sit still unless a force acts upon it. Rain, snow, mud and traffic jams were just some of the problems which us sheep encountered in our endeavours to keep all the farm animals safe in the process of driving our jeep up and down the hills. Across the duration of the conceptual play world interventions, we were able to see qualitative development in Peyton's understanding of the complex interplay between movement, force, gravity, mass and speed. Now the big question is, based on this study, what are we learning about the ways parents can provide motivating conditions for children's STEM concept formation in the home setting? Well, the first pattern we are noticing is that parents' professions bring rich qualities to children's social situation of development. We are learning that parent professions can influence family values towards learning and the formation of family pedagogy. We are noticing that families who work in a practical and trades professions requiring manual skills and special training tend to value children's formation of everyday STEM concepts in the form of life skills. On the other hand, families who work in professions involving the application of knowledge gained through academic exercise and conceptualisations tend to value the formation of scientific concepts. 
Everyday concepts are concepts which are developed spontaneously in collaboration with others through everyday activities. And on the other hand, scientific concepts are scientifically developed through systematic instruction and intentional teaching practices. I would like to highlight that both everyday and scientific concepts are equally important for children's STEM concept formation. And because the relationship between the two is dialectical, children require exposure to both in order to build strong STEM foundations. Like we see in the funds of knowledge, it is proposed that children develop intellectual knowledge through activities and lived experiences within their households and local communities. Every household is an educational setting where knowledge is transmitted with the purpose of enhancing survival. That's part of the funds of knowledge view. The second pattern we are noticing is that conceptual play worlds support parents' abilities to engage with both scientific concepts and everyday concepts. In Peyton's family pedagogy, there is high value placed on the formation of life skills. Peyton and her brother are involved in all aspects of family life and their contributions to the household are valued immensely. In our conceptual play worlds, Peyton demonstrated the wonderful ability to problem solve everyday scenarios in her imaginary play and approached this skill with great confidence and excitement. The imaginary nature of the conceptual play world intervention enabled scientific concepts to be weaved into the narrative in a way which was enjoyable and relevant to the family's local culture. The third pattern we are noticing is that parents are in a powerful position to remind children of STEM-related events which have taken place in their daily activity settings. This is because parents and children experience different contexts together in their daily activity settings. Teachers are in somewhat less of a position to be able to do this unless they are actively seeking information about children's institutional transitions. Having parents there to remind children of their prior interactions with the world supported children's conceptualisation of STEM problems as they could draw from their prior understandings and transfer that knowledge, as was mentioned earlier. I'm now very excited to play for you a short video of Peyton and Christy and myself about to enter our first conceptual play world. and Christy this information immediately. This is a big emergency. Oh no. Oh, oh no, something's happened. You guys ready to hear it? The piggies just told me that it has been raining so much that the hill has turned to mud. Oh no. And now the jeep just goes down the hill so quickly, just skidding everywhere because mud is so slippery. It's too uh -oh. slippery for the jeep to roll down and also it's too slippery for the animals to walk down. <laughs> so the reason why I chose to play this video is so that I could set the scene of the type of interaction which took place between Peyton and Christy in the study. In this video, we can see that Christy is very involved in the interaction. We can also see that Christy is making efforts to engage in building a sense of suspense. This is important because suspense, excitement and tension, as Marilyn discussed earlier, play a role in solving STEM concepts through conceptual play. I've got two more videos, but my time is running very low. So I'll just play this one and we'll see how we're going. Oh, okay. Oh, be Peyton sheep. Oh, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so 
in this video, we saw Peyton, Christy and myself scooping rainwater out of the Jeep to make it light enough to push to safety. We can see that children in this study were motivated to become play partners with their parents. We can see that there is a collective imaginary space which Christy was very much a part of. Peyton was very eager for her mother to take on the role of a character other than herself. In this sense, Christy shifted from her real relations as a parent to form play relation in this collective space. This was consistent with all children in the study. They all wanted their parents to be involved as a character other than themselves. Now for a very exciting video where we see Peyton engaging in imaginary play to solve an overarching problem. Hey, we better drive slowly. Why do you have to stop? Oh no, and it's so slippery. We've got to find a way to stop it, don't we? She's just getting some rocks. Fantastic. And, um, Sylvia, she, that is an incredible idea, putting the pram in front of the Jeep. But does the pram have wheels? Yes. So what would happen if the Jeep starts rolling down the mud and the pram is meant to stop it, but the pram also has wheels? What's going to happen? The reason I chose to play this video is so that I could communicate the way that Peyton's lived experience in her local culture supported her to develop her understanding of the concept of inertia. Peyton's family own a trailer. They use rocks to wedge against the wheels of the trailer to prevent it from rolling down hills. So in this video snippet, we saw that Peyton went to find rocks, but when she couldn't find any, she returned with a pram. Through intentional teaching practices, she was able to understand that using an object with wheels would not stop another object with wheels from rolling down the hill. Peyton solved the problem by using heavy objects instead. We can see maturity of play as Peyton walks as though she is carrying heavy bags through slippery, muddy grass. And to finish... We're noticing several exciting patterns emerge from our pilot study data. We are observing that the pedagogical structure offered in conceptual play worlds help parents to support their children's STEM learning. Conceptual play worlds also empower parents to create ample and diverse opportunities for collective problem solving, placing parents in an effective position to support STEM learning at home. And very importantly, we can say with great confidence that parents are in a powerful position to ensure children's long-term engagement in STEM. Thank you. So we've just heard um, from our wonderful team in Pillar 2 about how um, conceptual play worlds changes the developmental conditions for children in families. And I'm going to just now really bring this session to a close by mentioning just a few little things in relation to these last two points. And really what I want to share is, and again, it will be in the... Um, chat these papers or on our working papers or our working papers on our website if you don't have access to them. Um, what we're learning essentially is that in the context of a conceptual play world um, that imagination of teachers also really matters and this is something that's not in the literature around teachers professional development and so so this is one key finding that we've had because teachers are imagining in their professional development what a mature form of a conceptual play world looks like and there's further detail in the paper 
We're also, also learning um, in relation to the way in which teachers develop over time when they are engaged in a conceptual play world, that they begin with the idea of focusing on the um, STEM phenomenon, as we talked about before, in relation to the book, right through to thinking about what is the authentic problem that will be motivating for children to want to solve. And we saw a beautiful example of that in the material that um, Sonia shared. So the motivating condition was there. We also learned um, from our research um, that the conceptual play world is making a difference to teachers' confidence and competence in teaching STEM. And whilst this work is still ongoing, we have much more to learn about this across settings. We're, we're very excited that with all of the papers that are coming through in terms of how this matters for girls and women, um, that this is a very important thing in an area that is predominantly um, female um, profession. And so in conclusion, what we have learned is very, we feel, is very spectacular because we know that um, as part of our work that all of these papers and the ongoing papers um, that we're writing but others that have been published that we haven't discussed tonight, that they give us insights into the key role of the educator. So there's no longer, um, there's ever, there is sufficient evidence to show how important their role is in play, in being part of the play, in supporting the play development to mature it. It's not just an action. It is something that develops psychologically for children and we see this strong connection between collective play, concepts and the way that they create new play scenarios. We also have learned very much that um, the nature of the concepts and the different cult cultural age periods, whether it's infants, toddlers or preschoolers or into the school settings, requires a context where the educators are creating um, play world conditions that begin with props, but as the props are no longer needed, the imagination is, is actually taking forward the conceptual play. And this, of course, we know is important for conceptual learning and particularly important for STEM concepts, which are very abstract, decontextualised and, and needing a particular form of learning um, environment to take it forward. So the last thing I want to do is, is share how that the teaching model that we've developed, we feel very optimistic that this is making a huge difference to families, making a huge difference to educators' development and making a huge difference to children's development, particularly in the we're learning so much more about infants and toddlers uh, and, and in an under-researched area. But I want to just leave you with, because we've presented some evidence, we want to leave you with the words of, of because uh, um, we're in an international community, we have many people... Um, um, we have many people who are zooming in um, from a range of, of countries, like a huge number. And, um, and this is um, Victoria from Samoa. And this is the video I mentioned at the very beginning uh, to take us out before we go into Q&A. is a really great way to draw on the cultural context in which we sit. So in Samoa, we can draw on the traditional stories, then explore together traditional style of engineering techniques. We have real lived experience for the children that we are engaging and learning with. Victoria. I'm an Australian early childhood teacher. I have been working with Samoan educators in my preschools to develop culturally responsive play pedagogies and part of that was to introduce the STEM work through the conceptual play models the modules in the playland. So I have material your resources for material Mikey. Now only to Alo. Ele o no fo elato, o le me o vi nga, o meaningful or purposeful, ya lato ta alonga ni tan. I tell why you know wa, ba ya o no Victoria i, i ba ya purposeful. Ya o Victoria la, we are also expert. We are fire, we are fire na ya, o ile ba ya lato, be fast in the bike. Le me enta o le conceptual play world, ba nga ile la ko. Engineer, from my commissioner, from my Yalale, from my local local in my share my Yalako. 
been an intrinsic learning. It's come from the children themselves. They've asked the questions. I see the children developing those skills and continuing the play world outside during their own free play time. They were building fales and they were talking about different ways that we can engineer houses. So the play world doesn't start and stop only in the preschool. What's fantastic about the professional development is that it's equitable, which doesn't often happen, and especially for us in Samoa, it's really hard to gain access to quality research-based professional development. This has been a fantastic opportunity for educators here in Samoa to access a global community of practice where we can share and learn from each other and it offers us an equitable playing field when developing our profession here in Samoa. Excellent. Right, I think they all deserve a big round of applause. And if I was a teacher, this is the time I'd get you to all stand up and just shake down and get the energy back in the room and just kind of get ourselves revved up. We've got 15 minutes left for questions and answers. I, to get you revved up before we move on to the Q&A and the poll questions, so if you're zooming in, do put questions in, do vote for them on the polls. I can got one thing that might excite you. Before we go on, I think I'm allowed to tell you this. If I'm not allowed to tell you this, then just forget I've said it. Marilyn and the Play Lab team are very excited about a new partnership with ABC's Play School Storytime and ABC Kids Early Education. So the team is going to work with Laura Stone, the ABC's early childhood education producer behind the scenes to prepare some super innovative materials for educators and families. So watch this space over the next few weeks and the next few months to find out more. And it's actually an excuse to start watching Play School as well. So <laughs> if you're talking about impact of academic research, engaging with ABC and Play School is just that's super exciting. So I think that's, again, I think that deserves a round of applause as well. I'm very impressed by that. Right, what we're going to do, we've got 15 minutes, so we can buzz through some questions and answers. So get voting. Hopefully the questions will come up on the screen, and you can vote the questions that you want to ask up to the top, and they can float back down again. But we can also take some questions from the floor as well, for those of you live in the room. So if anyone's got a question, do feel free to put your hand up. If not, before the voting starts, I've got one question just to kick off um, the team. This hasn't been planted at all. I'm super interested, Marilyn, what is special about STEM knowledge and STEM concepts? Or do you think this is transferable to other knowledge domains, I don't know, like morals or philosophy? Is there something about STEM knowledge that's particularly conducive to play and the conceptual play world model? I've been told I have to stand <laughs> in response to the questions. Um, this is a great question and it's really what we've been trying to discuss um, tonight. I think whilst the idea of a concept, because a concept is, um, if we're thinking about it theoretically, is actually the, the smallest unit, like a cell in the body, that explains all of the dimensions of your genetics. So it's like the smallest unit for explanatory power. And so it can, it can transcend all areas. But for us, what's really important is this relation between the phenomenon and the concept and the motivation of the child to really want to know the concept. And so what's unique about the early childhood period is that there's two things in my view, and one we, we, have, evidence, we have strong evidence around, but the, the view is that we often underestimate the capacity of young children to think and act and, and engage with, concept, with concepts. And our work is showing, actually, you've, in creating these conceptual play worlds where they are motivated, that this really, really matters. So, so I think what we've tried to present tonight is what's unique about this particular period of children's development. And, um, and so the question, of course, applies to all, but it's actually then looking at, well, it could look very different for older children's engagement. But for us, conceptual play worlds builds on this motivation to play, to be with others, to socially engage, to discover the world, and ask these, you know, have curiosities around phenomena like rainbows. 
but for us as educators to actually plan the conditions so that those children are not just wandering and being curious, because we want to maintain that, which the Play Worlds does, but we want them to also be able to think and act scientifically with engineering principles and so on, so that they actually, actually have a, a strong place in the world and can surprise everybody, and we know they can. Right, I'm going to take an educated guess that there's lots of teachers zooming in and voting that question up to the top. <laughs> How on earth do you make this work in a group of 20 children with two educators, some children that refuse to connect because of developmental de delays, AD, ASD, etc.? In other words, in the realities of a classroom, how do you make this work? Sonia. Well, basically, my thinking is that to make a conceptual play world work in, a, in an environment where you've got you know, 20 children and a few with additional needs is that you would look at the, the children who have those additional needs and try to work out what the hook is for them. Because with every child, there is a hook. There's, there's going to be something um, that they love or something which they engage in, which, um, which you can, if you discover what that is, you can utilise that within the conceptual play world to involve them. So it may not be that they are one of the central characters in the conceptual play world. It may be that they are a character but their role is focused on something different because there are so many different elements which come together to create a conceptual play world. Um, so, yeah, to answer the question, I think it is, and I don't know if Marilyn wants to add to that, but I think it's finding the hook for that individual child and, and that comes down to getting to know the child, what their interests are and making sure that the conceptual play world is relevant to them in their in their culture and it might be communicating with families as well about what will really hook that child. Probably just to add line there uh, is to just say that uh, as we have said as we have spoken yeah, as we have said that uh, you know the focus is largely around the social situation of development of the child. So every child has this unique relationship with their environment. Because I think you're asking a, if you're asking a specific answer, this demands a lot of work, uh, designing a conceptual play world for children. But uh, a, a larger conceptual answer would be that thinking holistically about children's social situation of development, how the child basically engages in their environment is something which is very, very central in designing it. Yeah. Okay, another question. I'm going to go for the third one and then the second one. It's all about context. So that you've explained how you make it work in a classroom with 20 kids and two educators. How do you make it work on Zoom? Were your Zoom interactions just one-on-one? -on -one? If not, how did you manage the various contexts, complexities of working virtually? Yeah, I think uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, we, so the, one of the experiments I talked about, um, called the educational experiment, uh, one of the things we, uh, I talked about is basically we worked in collaboration with uh, Playgroup Victoria, uh, Danny and Deborah here. Thank you for all the efforts you put in behind the scene. Uh, basically, we work first individually with families. We try to understand, as I just said, each family's social situation are very different and each child's developmental conditions are very different. So our first effort is basically to, to understand the family context, to understand each child's uh, developmental condition at, at that particular point of time. The second stage is where our group of educators uh, basically then think of what really is going to work with these uh, set of children. So we pick up a story, we also uh, you know, draw on the basis of parents' interests, we pick up a story, we pick up a concept, and then we try to weave in those narratives as Madeline mentioned about those five characteristics of the play world. And then uh, it basically starts with those 30-minute sessions of Zoom where we don't just go on to talk about what we really want to say, but also create opportunities for families to share what they have done. So after every 30-minute uh, session, uh, families do get a kind of a, you know, email from us which details to them what they can do in their home setting, what the resources they can use. So there's a lot of support that goes around those 30-minute sessions because our focus is not that 30-minute session, but rather is around what happens beyond that 30-minute session in their home setting. So the purpose is not to just intervene for 30 minutes, but rather to engage children holistically in the concept learning. If you are really interested, you can go back to our previous public lecture because I did talk about it uh, in detail in that lecture. 
And I'll just add to that to say that um, in that previous lecture, we also um, talked about family daycare educators, also another under-researched area. And we also used Zoom as part of the professional development of the educators. But we did it through actually working with the educators and their children. So, so we had the same conceptual play wheel being Zoomed in to the different homes together. And it was incredibly exciting. And we have some papers on that, if you're interested to look at those on our um, website. But one key thing that really matters in to answer this question is that these children on Zoom, so interested in each other's um, conceptual play world. They were so fascinated to know how did they go around the pond or what did they make or what were their designs that they created? What, were their, what did their maps look like? And so they were really, really passionate about that. But this also was really exciting from the point of view of the educators because they through experiencing and embodying the conceptual play worlds um, in a virtual setting of, the, uh, of Zoom, um, there was no distinction between home, researchers, children's families. We were all together interacting. It was very exciting. Excellent. Right. I'm going to bundle two questions together. And these are kind of asking the same question, just in different ways. We don't want to be too homogenous in our findings, and we don't say there's one size fits all. So. How is the conceptual play world's concept different in other countries or different countries? And also this idea of when you talk about a child or children, are you being, and this is a kind of homogenous model of what a child is, did you work with children from indigenous backgrounds, children from cultural and linguistically diverse communities, children who are neurodiverse? How much can we actually kind of generalise from what you found? This, this is a really important question and I'll answer it in two ways. One, one is to say that uh, when we're looking at the, the diversity of what makes up Australia, um, this we have a, the beginnings of that in our research. We still have two more years to continue to do our research. And our, our hope is that at the at, if you come along to our public lecture in 2024, we can answer that question really well. <laughs> Because we are just chipping away at this and we can't cover all cultural groups, all cultural communities. But also we want to, like um, Danny and Deb and Prabhat, we, we want to have um, collaborations with community groups who take this forward. We don't feel it's our place in some cultural context for us to be the people to say, this is how you do it. And the second thing that I want to say in terms of the international community is, is that it, we have um, UN here and Yuju is online who are two stunning PhD students in our, in our play lab. And both of them have been using Zoom across the two countries UN, here, UN is here in Australia and hasn't been able to go back to China. And Yuju is in China, hasn't been able to come back into Australia. And so what they have done is done this research together. And it's not just... Uh, and this is the conceptual play worlds in different cultural communities because it demands different kinds of ways of researching and it re requires people who are culturally embedded to take that forward. We think that's incredibly important. Um, and so that work is significant. You should also talk to... Um, um, Liang Li and follow her papers because she has also done some exceptional work in the uh, cultural context in Australia but also in China and taken forward conceptual play worlds in a really uh, exciting way. We know that Coulson's very interested to, to take this work um, forward uh, in, the, in the context of Bhutan and uh, – sorry <laughs> – New Nepal, sorry. Um, and uh, we also know that um, this work is, is having huge traction in a range of other countries. Um, and you saw Samoa being discussed as well. Um, we think this is really important. It will look different in different places, as it will look different in different families, as it will look in relation to families from different cultural communities in Australia. We are not the same people but we have a common humanity and we have a, a, a very um, broadly framed conceptual play world. Uh, and so we're learning about what that looks like and how that develops in different, uh, in different communities. I don't know if you want to Excellent. No, that's very comprehensive. Um, there's a couple of questions in the room. We'll have one question from the room. I think we've got time for one more. I'll just go through some of the questions up on the screen. I've got to say, a lot of the work that's been presented here is really complex. If you've looked at any of the abstracts that are flashed up on the screen, there's some quite hardcore um, kind of 
psychological science and learning science behind it all, and they've made it sound very, very, very simple. So the question above, how do you select the phenomenon concept to be discussed with the children, I guess is actually a very complex thing to explain. So one thing I would say is go on the website, you'll find answers to questions like that, questions about the digital nature of some of the play worlds, and also when play school is actually going to be coming on stream. So go to the um, Concept Play Lab website for that. One final question from the floor, just before we finish, because we have got some real people in the room. Wait for the microphone and do um, do speak to the online audience. So let's finish off with a live question from a real life person. <laughs> I have a very simple question. So whose responsibility it is to um, get parents involved in the, um, the um, I'm sorry, the play labs or um, the conceptual play world's approach? Sorry. Is it is it, like whose responsibility to involve parents? Is this, is it teachers' responsibility, researchers' responsibility? So who is going to introduce this to parents? Or are they just going to learn from somewhere? Okay. So just, yeah, sorry. <laughs> just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, understanding the mechanism, if you were asking. So we recruit through a number of uh, ways, uh, the participants. So one of them is through the play group. So we basically advertise on play group and we say that this is possible. If you are a family, you are interested, we are happy to take you for this Zoom enabled conceptual play world. We also, uh, in pillar two, working with families, also work through uh, early learning centers. So the research with Sonia presented is basically a uh, number of children from the early learning centers being followed because their families shown interest in our research. So we basically contacted them and tried to work with them. Uh, am I answering your question? You have a different question. But what if, what if like, um, as a teacher, mm -hmm. we are interested in this? Can we reach out or as, as a, a... Sorry, as a... Like, so you mentioned if a, if a family is interested, they can yeah. reach out. But what if uh, a teacher is interested in the program? Can we reach out or how can we reach yes. out? Yes. So, uh, in fact, it's on the website. So you can go uh, on the website. There's an EOI form. You can just uh, type in there. We will surely contact. You can also write any of us and we will surely know. So uh, there are a number of ways in which you can contact and we would surely love to work with uh, uh, early, early, you know, educators. And also uh, that, you know, you can... Uh, so the other possible way is go on the website. There's also self based PD, you can also do professional development and be a certified you know, conceptual play world educator. That's also possible. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it's free. And it's free. Yeah. <laughs> it's fabulous. There you go. That's a promise. It's free for everybody. Yeah. Well, thanks to the ARC. Indeed, yes. Thanks to the ARC. Well, thanks ever so much for a really fascinating 90 minutes. I'd like to thank all the presenters and the Conceptual Play Lab. I would definitely like to thank the technical crew. We've got Chantel and Reggie and Chris and Patrick and Jen and Henry and all the student ambassadors that got you in here and got, going to get you out. I'd like to thank everyone in the room for coming and actually being here. And actually, I'd like to thank everyone online as well. So good night, good evening, good morning, and hopefully see you for the next lecture in a couple of months' time.